Hello, welcome to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with you once again, and we are doing a brand new novel. I am doing a brand new challenge after Herds successfully managed to pick us a sport-related book after I oh just about failed at my own task. Uh, we are talking Naomi Hirahara's Sayonara Slam, the sixth book in the Maz Arai murder mystery series. First six chapters. Listen, Ben. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I set myself the task of finding a sport-related mystery from Japan. I failed. And it was impossible. Ended up going with, with uh-huh. Jock Sarong, which was a great read. And you ended up going with Naomi Hirahara, who is Japanese American. Yep, yep. So look, I'm I'm half halfway there. Yeah, um. completely completely valid, completely <laughs> valid. Because we're exploring the culture, we're exploring the influences. That's what it's all about. You've done yep. yourself well. Mm-hmm. However, when I got to read this book, Ben, mm. uh, I was expecting a Japanese baseball related mystery, whereas really <laughs> it is a. Uh, a journalism mystery yeah. framed around baseball. I, I like that you've gone for a bit of a, a cozy opening to this episode because this this novel was definitely not what I was expecting. I I dug through dozens, literally dozens of murder mysteries mm-hmm. all framed around mostly Mahjong, you know, trying to find a Japanese or even, you know, Eastern uh, murder mystery that wasn't written by someone not from the culture because that is impossible. Yes. We love our alliteration. So Mahjong Murder Mystery is a great title for a, for a book. That's right. Um, <laughs> as, as we learned last week. But yeah, no, Sayonara Slam, despite, uh, and, and this is quite quite an interesting thing the author has done because she's, she's Japanese American. She's exploring her own culture and her own upbringing in society and her feelings about Hiroshima, like it's a very politically driven book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's using something that Japan and America have uh, in, in common, which is which is baseball as, as this like loose framing device. Yeah. But you're right. We don't really follow the baseball aspect for very long. We spend much more time um, because Mas, uh, who, and I hope you appreciate this, he stumbles across the murder by the end of the first chapter, which I was really happy with. Uh, he ends up getting embroiled in this mystery, not because he's at the scene of the crime, which you would expect, but rather because uh, this this other this other chap, this other gentleman, uh, Mr. Yuki, uh, hires Mas as a driver. Because he's, you know, Mas is an old man. He knows the streets. Also, Yuki doesn't speak English, and he's in Los Angeles. Yes, so he needs someone who can, who can speak as a language. Uh, and and get him around. It is a very comfy book, as, as I say. Watching Mars drive around and mm-hmm. and chaperone Yuki and try to slowly piece things together, because uh, he's like seventy years old. Uh, it's th- this book is a delightful time. Um, it, it's definitely a book that I wouldn't have used for the show if we weren't looking for something sport related. Though I, I will say, um, it's a little bit out of my my ballpark. Ah, uh, well wink. done. Got well him. done. Da, 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 da. I was wondering <laughs> how long that joke was going to take to come up. I had a few opportunities in my notes here to make it, and you've, you've right. just taken you can, taken the, look, the wind can, right out from under my wing. Let wings. me say, if you can find a better way to insert that joke into into the, the script here, you know that we all oh, we of course we from. always script. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go for it. You know, maybe you'll get bonus points. No, but yeah, you're totally right. This is a super cozy miss. History. I mean, Maz is like 80 years old, as you say, is a yeah, Hiroshima survivor, which I believe, yes. I believe was also the same experience her father had, right? Yes. So her father was born in America and then traveled to Hiroshima before World War II, or maybe mm-hmm. as it was starting. That I haven't verified. And he was there for the, for, for the bomb. He was there for Hiroshima. Yep. <laughs> uh, and he survived, uh, which is fascinating came back to America. This story and I guess all the Master Eye books are really about uh, Naomi Hirahara here exploring yeah. her father's reality, which I find really fascinating. Mm. You know, when we talk about detectives that are created for for you know the novel of an author, they're often extensions of themselves. And obviously this is. Naomi is also a, a Japanese American who has a history with World War II, but Master Rai really is her 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 own father and what she remembers of him. 
um, which I find really fascinating. We start off with a classic setup, right? Masurai is there at the murder scene. Not only that, but he. Uh, what, this is this is so funny to me that when I'm looking to like purchase the novel, part of the the pitch, the blurb is that, you know, Masurai hands the water bottle to this journalist just before he, he dies and, like, Masurai is in, implicated in the mystery, but we never really get to that point. Yeah, the police you know? show up, they're a bit rude to him, and then we just move on. And it's great. Yeah, but but yeah, I like it's a very classic, like, fairy tale kind of or children's story setup where we have this slow, calm, collected character uh, paired up with a, a younger character, Yuki, it's like, I got to drive places and figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a scene where Yuki is, uh, they, they see that like one of the other re- reporting stations is going off to to find a mystery. And he says, follow that car. And Master's like, why <laughs> would I follow that car? And he's like, well, if they're going to report it, then it's worth us checking it out. Yeah. And Master's like, you know, he internally, he's like, oh, this is why the news is so terrible. This is why I don't tune in because they're all just copying each other and it's everybody's in a hurry and da 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 da. It's all a competition. Like, he's very much like he's a turtle, you know, and he's he's slow and steady, but he's he's going to win the race, at least we hope. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing I did want to talk about, and this is, this is the first downside I want to bring up to this story, Uh-oh. is that alongside it feeling very relaxing and chill and just being an enjoyable read... It feels kind of cluttered by its mystery. My concern is that when the most engaging part of this mystery is Maz and his personal struggles, I'm worried that the kind of technical details of the knuckleball pitches and all of that from the beginning of the novel is going to come back to bite us later. Yeah. Um, there, there is the potential that that's just part of the framing device. Sure. So realistically, this is a super, super minor point. Um, I just really hope that as we press on with the novel, it latches onto what's best about it rather than trying to drag it too much back towards the mystery. Because despite being a mystery series, I think that that's that's not the strong suit of this story. We'll talk about this in the last part of the show today, but I am extremely confident on the who and the how, but the the why. (laughs) Yeah. We'll find out. Look, I'm I'm curious to see how well you do with this. That's all I'm gonna say, uh, and we'll see if you can if you can help yourself some points. I think the other thing that I did want to talk about with this novel is, I guess, just as a Western reader's experience going through the the way that it tries to do Japanese accents and speech in the text <laughs> is really interesting. Yeah, um, I really didn't get it until I dove into the audiobook, which you were going through from the start. Yeah, Herds. it's great. It's great. When I listened to the audiobook, I thought that the voice actor was like putting in all this language to just spice uh-huh. things up until I actually saw the text. I, I kind of love it. I kind of love the way that Naomi has tried to differentiate all the characters by their different dialects. Yeah. It's very interesting. It, it's, I think that she's done a really good job of it, but I think that the struggle that I had and the reason I ended up switching to the audiobook is because I haven't grown up around that culture, some of the accents and particularly uh, some of both the, you know, Americanisms from California and the particularly Japanese Americanisms and the code switching between the languages. Yeah. Like just reading them, the way that they're sounded out phonetically is probably accurate to how a Japanese person would sound them out or how someone familiar with it would sound it out but I was just reading the words completely wrong until I <laughs> went to the audiobook and it was mm. like way more clunky. I was like yeah. doing doing my best to try like put on a Japanese accent to say some of the words and being like, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't fit. Anyhow, Herds, I think we will we will call it there. Throw to the tunes. Bring it in. Bring it in, Paul. Paul mm. Meter, our wonderful musician. Paul Meter. Uh, we are discussing Naomi Hirahara's Sayonara Slam, the sixth Maz Arai murder mystery. We'll be back back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with you. I'm currently joined on the line by the author of Sayonara Slam, Naomi Hirahara, here on our first episode discussing this book. And Naomi, it is so good to have you here with us to talk about this book because we have been loving it so far. And I am currently the one in the hot seat trying to solve everything. And... I don't, I don't know where to begin on that front because from a murder mystery perspective, 
I think that the murder mystery of this book is really secondary to just how great the character of Mazarai is because he's just so heartwarming. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny because I've written about, I guess, 10 different murder mysteries and seven of them feature Masarai. So I actually went back and started rereading Sayonara Slam for myself. And I was going, this is like one crazy book. I mean, it's kind <laughs> of like a game of baseball in that there's so many different players. And if you're really into a sport like baseball, you know that there's history, superstition, tradition, it's all steeped within. So, um, yeah, I it has a lot of moving parts, that's for sure. But I think, yeah, you'll you have to keep reading it to um I think hone in on your suspects there. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got an idea. We'll see how it pans out for me. Okay. <laughs> when we when we look through this book, we came into this book uh expecting it to be a sports murder mystery, which it is, don't get me wrong. But the thing that really struck me when we got started is that it diverges from sport really quickly into a story that's really about journalism, which I understand you've been a journalist for a lot of your career as well. So how is it that you go about seeding aspects like this into a murder mystery story to kind of critique the industries that you're most familiar with? You know, what's it like putting that critique into the form of a murder mystery? You know, it's kind of interesting. In most of my murder mysteries, there is a journalist. So I I guess I just can't help myself. And um, I don't really have much experience with law enforcement. So I I do think, uh, you know, whether it's and I guess a journalist tends to play a minor role, but still an important role, an instigator. And I think it's kind of perfect um, because especially right now there especially in the United States there's so much controversy concerning law enforcement so I think now instead of your standard police procedurals people are readers are kind of looking for that PI or you know how about a journalist mm-hmm. although they are you know they're not without controversy themselves but um For me, I mean, I just, I think that's how I entered into writing mysteries. Um, One of, I've been in conversation virtually a few times with Michael Connolly. So, um, and he worked at the LA Times, which was, you know, um, very close to my much smaller Japanese American newspaper where I worked as a reporter and editor. But I think we both have kind of similar approaches in that we're not necessarily casting judgment on, you know, we're not necessarily writing like message uh, books, but we're just fascinated by the outside, how um, different forces like come against each other and kind of reflecting that and capturing that. So with this book, Sayonara Slam, I'm uh, also at the heart of it is relationships between um, Korea and Japan which is a really hot topic as well. So, um, but it turns out the murder mystery is kind of a more of a nonpartisan way of kind of um, deconstructing all these very sensitive issues. Yeah, and I think that's something that's been really prevalent through the history of murder mystery. Our favorite example on the show being Rex Stout's Too Many Cooks, which dealt a lot with race narratives. And you mentioned in there your small Japanese newspaper, Rafu Shimbu, which gets a mention in the book here. And for, I guess, a foreign culture taking hold in a country like America, how important is it for newspapers like Rafu Shimpo to kind of connect the community that otherwise would be kind of scattered throughout uh, a region that doesn't necessarily have the kind of, you know, flavors of home? It's absolutely crucial. And um, a place like Japan that values literature and the value books and words. They were like several Japanese language newspapers just in Los Angeles and throughout the United States, there were dozens. Now there's not as many, but that Rafu Shimpo still exists, believe it or not. And it was established in 1903. So it's beyond just um, reaching like immigrants. It's, you know, some of the readers are maybe fourth generation Japanese Americans. So this is a source that will cover things that a larger paper will not. 
And we feel that it's important to sustain our communities. Like there's a vibrant little Tokyo in Los Angeles. We need a voice like um, the Rafa Shimpo. Yeah, no, I think that's a great touch. And one of the things I love most about Mars is that uh, as well as being inspired by your father, as you mentioned, which is another thing we'll get into in a moment, but he, he has just a young person's problems in an old person's body. And it's so heartwarming seeing him go through relationship struggles and family struggles in a way that I guess feels extremely accessible and is probably totally normal. But framing it in that way is, I think, really unique because it humanizes him in a way where you think of your grandparents as these kind of old, out of touch people, but suddenly Mazarai puts them back into just an ordinary human's mindset. You know, how is it writing a character like that based off your family and giving them these problems that are so relatable? Is is there an aspect of your own family story in those struggles? I think it's more... Um observational and not necessarily my family, but seeing other families, my friends' families. For instance, my um, husband's, uh, his grandmother lived to 100 and she was living with her one of her sons who was widowed too. And, um, and he was kind of hanging out at a eatery, you know, and he had a lady friend and the lady friend would keep calling the house and grandma would they called her mama would answer. And when she would hear hear that woman's voice, she would hang up. And then (laughs) my husband's uncle's like saying, I'm 70 something years old. Can't I have my own life? (laughs) And I thought that was just hilarious. (laughs) Like, it doesn't matter how old you are. There's that still that, you know, child parent kind of relationship involved. And I would hear that from other friends, um, like their mothers would you know, who had lost their husbands and were dating, were asking, were telling their daughters about, you know, their dating woes. And I was going, whoa, it never ends. It's not like you hit hit a certain age and romance is out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then as, as I was saying, you've based Mars off your father and your family has such an interesting history. What with being Hiroshima survivors and then moving to Japan when they did, you know, I've, I've read in an article with NPR that your dad was initially skeptical of being adapted into this murder mystery hero. So over the years of writing Mazurai, how has the character evolved? I mean, I imagine it was probably a lot more like your father to begin with, but how has he changed over the course of his books and kind of become his own identity? Well, the first book took me 15 years in terms wow. of writing it and publication. And I think part of it was, I was pretty young when I started it. So to write about, number one, a different gender, and also someone way older than you, um, I think, you know, it took me to kind of grow into Mm. (laughs) writing that particular story. How he's changed is the first book is very pungent. And he was so incredibly reluctant. He didn't want to get out of the chair. And I think that's another reason why it took me 15 years, because it didn't start to be a murder mystery. And then once I I call it that the mystery was the perfect container. Once I Mm. placed it in that container and used like clues, you know, and made it more of a higher stakes so that Moss would get out of his easy chair, then it started to actually move and become a novel that you would want to read. And I didn't really think about you know, writing so many books, but my publisher wanted, you know, when they purchased the first book, they said, well, we want the second book next year. And I'm going, whoa. (laughs) Bit of of a step up in pace. So it it does change, you know, in terms of really, he would never consider, you know, dating and being in a relationship. He wouldn't have, he was uh, very much estranged from his daughter in the first book, which does, does not reflect my own relationship. But it was like something that I would see other people like having, you know, things had happened in their uh, when they were younger regarding a parent. And so, you know, relationship was broken. 
But so over the course of the books, they become, now they're like living by Sayonara Slam, they're living in the same house. Yeah. Which I think reflects a lot of intergenerational living today. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's such a wonderful thing for a character like Mazarai to come along and be so heartwarming and engaging, but also still deal with these serious issues of the ethics of journalism, the ethics of sport, and, you know, the history of the Japanese American culture. Naomi, it's been so wonderful speaking with you about this. And thank you so much for joining us here on Death of the Reader this week. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Death of the Reader Flex here. We are discussing Naomi Hirahara right there. Sayonara Slam, chapters one to six. And we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with you. We are discussing Sayonara Slam. By Naomi Hirahara, chapters one to six. Herds, <laughs> I have got a mystery to solve. I know. I'm I'm excited to see how you've done with this. I feel like I haven't given you like a lot of space to work with. No, maybe, no, you definitely have not. Me. Maybe you'll surprise me and just pull a, a murder culprit out of your hat immediately and just no. go I mean, home with all the marbles. Listen, I think that the who in this novel. The only problem I have with picking who is that it may be too obvious. Okay. Because as we've covered before on this show, my standard method is to lay out my most likely culprits, go through them, uh, and read the reread the section with them in mind and see if it fits. And going through the knuckleball pitches, going through uh, the other journalists, no one fit. Okay. No one, interesting, uh, interesting. particularly Amica. Amica, I was really suspicious of. Okay, interesting. Um, because of the way that she's introduced, and she, you know, comes in with this aura of power to the room w- when they're talking about all the journalists at the start, and then it says that uh, Itai was about to ba- break some big news for Japanese baseball. I was like, aha, is, it's Amica, is. and she's mm-hmm. trying to take him down and get his story, or she's working for the people behind the corruption that he's trying to expose, or something like oh, that. Oh damn! Oh damn! But then I read through the rest of the novel, and that was just about the only characterization she's had so far. (laughs) Interesting. Uh, On the other hand, Sonny Hirose had the victim stay with him, had access to his medication, had similar medication to him so knew how it worked, and, you know, has this weird conversation where he says, It was bound to happen at any point. After the police have publicly declared that it was cyanide poisoning. Interesting. If that isn't a man trying to cover himself, I don't mm, know what is. So Sonny, Sonny Heroes that you believe is the is the culprit here. Absolutely no doubt in well, okay, a little bit of doubt. Just a little bit of doubt. <laughs> a little bit of it's doubt. Interesting. In my I'm mind. surprised you haven't gone for Amica. She is a very strong female character, you know, she's just, she's just doing it for herself, trying to get that story. Yeah. I think Amica is still going to be involved in the broader narrative of this story Interesting. in a way that is befitting of her introduction, mm. but I do not think that she is going to be the culprit. Okay. I think that the mention specifically of that, his drug uh, for blood pressure that may have been swapped out was like the big linchpin that set me off aside from his comment that I mentioned. So, it, it's a weird one because I think that this mystery is in that sense very straightforward that the man he was staying with had some grudge against him, swapped his medicine out because he knew how it worked. I don't know how he had access to uh, to the like uh, chemical cyanide or whatever. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it is mentioned that he ran a jewelry store. And I know that cyanide is like it's like a cleaning chemical in some senses. Right. So that would be the most likely explanation as to why he has access to cyanide, though that's still a bit flimsy. But it, it, it's like a weird one, right? Because in my mind, it's so obvious to the point where it's almost too obvious. Sure. But it's not too obvious because the novel has said so. Okay. Like, he's a very suspicious character. He has opportunity, means, and declares it in a very weird way, but he doesn't really have a tangible motive thus far. I was, I was going to say, it sounds like uh, Amika or maybe one of the other reporters or, or maybe even one of the players might have a, a more tangible motive. Maybe uh, this sunny character is being used in some way as part of a plot. Like, who knows? Who knows? Maybe he's an accomplice, but you seem to think he's the he's the killer. Yeah. Um, and I, I would love to know why you think that is, if you think there's any sort of tangible motive there. The, it's, it's difficult to say thus far. I think that there's a lot of detail to unpack in that scene, and if anything, they kind of 
hammered you with information in that scene. They do that a lot. Like, it, you know, it's, there's, and this is what I was talking about in the first I part, know, where it I feels know. a bit crowded by the mystery, yeah. right? Um, you know, they hammer you with, I used to work at a jewelry store. He would have dropped dead at any point. He was staying at my place. I had the same blood medications, just one after the other, after the other. And it's kind of like beating you over the head with all of these different details. And again, that sometimes can make it feel a bit too obvious. The only thing, the only thing that I can grab onto in that scene that may constitute motivation when we're bringing up the, uh, the prisoner of war camps and I think thematically that is fitting for how Mazarai appears as a character, being very involved with uh, the broader contexts and struggles of World War II. Sure. It's it's kind of a struggle to sit here and accurately pin it on Sonny um, because he is a bit too obvious. I, I enjoy the way that this mystery is still making me doubt myself when there's a part of me that feels it's really obvious. I, I think that that's actually well done puzzle construction thus far, if this is the case. It does widen the pool somewhat. It, it, there's a lot less of those, like, el- you know, eliminating scenes. Like, okay, so this character did not have access to the key, or this character, you know, never had a conversation with this person. They could not be the killer. Um, so it gives you, as the person trying to solve the mystery, a lot more freedom um, in this open, open circle mystery to kind of wade through all of the various bits and pieces of mostly irrelevant information. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great for world building. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a really interesting move to pull off as a mystery writer because uh, th- th- the the way that I think I have found most effective to unravel a mystery that does this is saying, why is this here? Sure. You know, and if you assume that every detail is used and it has to be used in some way, you have to kind of piece together puzzle after puzzle. But for example, if we look at like the Japanese garden at, at Dodger Stadium, like it's kind of described in this weird, creepy way that yeah. is a real outlier from the coziness of the rest of the novel. I don't have any explanation for that. So I'm kind of clutching at straws in a really fun way. When I was reading about the garden, how like overgrown and uh, dare I say maze like it is, was like I thought he was going to find a body there. I was. I I thought either someone's going to hide a body here later, or there's going to be a chase scene through these gardens. Like this is where we're going to corner the killer. Like it's like those little potholes and stuff. Someone's going to trip. Chekhov's pothole. I did want to mention before we run out of time this episode because I thought this was funny. I, I wonder what Naomi means, and maybe you have some ideas beyond just the fact that he's, you know, the murder victim. It's I actually is Japanese for like, ouch. Like it's sort of onomatopoeia for, oh, I'm in pain. I don't know if there's any more significance there. I just think it's a, a very interesting choice to say, all right, this person gets killed in the opening chapters. Uh, what do I name them? Oh yeah, it, ouch. Like, <laughs> why? <laughs> I just want to mention that because it's a very strange kind of artifact. And I feel like, I feel like you, you couldn't use that in anything other than a like Japanese American novel. I will interrogate you about your second point uh, next week. The, the article in question hasn't come up yet, but Whew. I guess, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on Masurai and his love life? She, Gen- Genesee? Genese? Oh, right. I Believe? see. Okay. So after I, after I was in the hot seat last time and I messed up a story because I said that I would yeah. always suspect the lover and I'm then you finally curious. baited me into not expecting a lover and then yeah. it ended up being the lovers. Now <laughs> we're going to bring it up again. I, I'm just And it's going to turn up that Genesee was the killer all along. I'm not, I would never say uh, that. I would never suspect the lover, but. Do you think there's any chance of her being the killer or being, you know, involved in the murder at all? Absolutely or do you think she's not. just No. Okay. I think that she's a framing <laughs> device for Maz. I think she's probably appeared in the other novels and we just haven't had experience with her. Um, that said, I do think Maz is going to get the girl at the end. I hope so. Because we've introduced the struggle of him not being able to be honest. And Yuki seems to be a pretty honest guy. So maybe they're both going to learn from each other. And it'll be really heartwarming. Yuki will learn how to be a turtle. And Mars will learn how to be assertive, and it'll be great. <laughs> how to love again. That's the one. Oh. All right, Herds. What do we have for next week? Uh, next week, we'll be covering chapters uh, 7 to 11 uh, of, of Sayonara Slam by Naomi Kirahara. Uh, inclusive. And we'll I'll throw you your, your second points question uh, in the early parts next week, and we'll see, we'll see what you can figure out. Yeah, I'm looking forward I'm to it. I'm frightened. I'm scared. You should be. 
This is an intimidating novel with lots of twists and turns, just like that old forgotten Japanese garden. Oh, God. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are discussing Naomi Hirahara's Sayonara Slam, the sixth book in the Maz Arai series. We hope you will join us again next week to chat about the next few chapters as we drive further towards the other parts of Los Angeles in the back of Masarai's broken down old car. As we do. We're Flex and Herds. This is Death of the Reader. We'll see you then.